Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. So by popular demand, we are continuing the Adult Improver series. And for those people tuning in who do not know what that is, you can check out the interview I did about two months ago with uh, Andres Krizdwa, where we talk, we do an extreme focus on adult improvement. So we'll also be talking about our guest's life and her career and uh, her, her perspective of how she got into chess and stuff like that. But the primary emphasis will be to help all you uh, chess die how, diehards out there get some tips on how to continue to improve. And I think our guest uh, this week will be a, a great person to talk about that. So she got into tournament chess in 2016. Her rating started in the 1100s and now is up to 1777, I believe. Uh, with a 300-point jump in the last year, and she's promised to tell us all of our, her secrets. So, Stacia Pugh, thank you for joining us here on Perpetual Chess. Thanks for having me. So, a lengthy introduction, Stacia, but I just you're pretty active on social media. I know you've got some fans already, and for those who haven't heard uh, of you, I think that they'll they'll be inspired by what you're doing, both over the board and uh, your your career moves that we'll also get into. Uh, but why don't you just start by telling our listeners a little bit about uh, where you live and how you got into chess and stuff like that. Um, okay. Um, so I live in Lakewood, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland, um, right up on Lake Erie. Um, I got into chess originally in college. So like a friend showed me how to play and we would play and I, I was never serious about it, but I remember loving the game and um, just playing with friends and stuff. I had no idea there was a tournament circuit or, or uh, an entire chess world that was completely beyond me. Um, and then um, after a while that faded and um, fast forward to the future, one of my friends um, at work had chess with friends on their smartphone and the day I discovered chess again probably changed my life, or it definitely did, <laughs> because I was like, wow, I remember how much I love this game, and now I bet there's a bunch of YouTube videos that will teach me how to play. Are there ever? <laughs> yeah, so that was a good hunch. Yeah. Um, and once I started watching the YouTube videos, I was definitely hooked, found my local uh, chess club, the Parma Chess Club. Um, this is the strongest club in the Cleveland area, and I joined there in November um, 2016 and been enjoying it ever since. <laughs> yeah, and chess seems quite strong in Ohio. I lived in Pittsburgh for several years and I would, you know, it being down the road, so to speak, I would check out what was happening there. And I know that there seemed to be a pretty vibrant scholastic scene and a lot of people interested in chess relative to the population size. Is that is that your impression as well? Um, yeah, definitely. Like there's, there's one organization in particular, um, progressive chess that holds a lot of scholastic events and promotes chess in a big way. And then there seems to be a variety of chess clubs and a lot of masters. Um, I think we only have one IM in Cleveland, um, but a lot of strong masters. So, um, seems to be a pretty vibrant scene. And so you've gotten involved and you started to play tournaments. Why don't you tell us, so what was it like your first chess tournament? Describe the emotions. Uh, how did it go results-wise? Tell us the story. <laughs> Do you mean like my first time going to the local chess club? Well, let's. we can start with that, but also the first time you competed in a tournament. Oh, okay. Um, well, at my local chess club, um, really my mindset was I need to gain tournament experience. And it doesn't, my results don't matter so much. I need to learn how to notate. I need to make sure I don't make illegal moves. <laughs> That's <laughs> what my mindset was. Um, and I think I did make a few illegal moves. <laughs> but, um, but I needed to get that first one under my belt. And I just believe that tournament experience is important if you, if you actually want to compete. Um, not just knowing how to play, but experiencing that and knowing how to deal with the challenges of that. Um, then when I entered my first tournament, um, like bigger tournament, it was actually a really, um, interesting experience. Uh oh, Sounds like you're being <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. A negative one because 
um, I had just jumped from like 1200 to 1400 feeling really good about my chest, you know, like, Ooh, I'm starting to get good. And I went down to the Columbus open about two hours away in Ohio. And, um, yeah, I played an unrated player in my first game and I got, uh, crushed in about 13 moves. So that was disappointing. Then I played someone about 300 points lower rated than me. I lost that game <laughs> and then I lost my last game or I, or I should say my third game, which became my last game when I was just like, okay, time to go. <laughs> so that's, that's how I started. Um, and, uh, you know, but I'm somebody that says, okay, what can I learn from this experience? And I kind of went from there. Good for you. And I will tell you, Stacia, if it makes you feel any better, the level of unrated players has skyrocketed in the YouTube age. It used to be that mm-hmm. like when I was growing up and I started playing chess in 1989 was my first tournament. And back then, if you played an unrated, you could be pretty sure that they they didn't know their way around a chessboard too well. But now, thanks to all of the the incredible content content sharers online, there there are tons of unrated players who have like two thousand ratings on Lee Chess or Chess dot com, and they're just finally getting around to playing a tournament. So I wouldn't say losing at thirteen moves is indicative of anything. Um, okay, and obviously your results subsequently have proven that, but. Um, you know, obviously, you're being a woman. It's something I'm I'm curious about because uh, I, you know, I, as a lover of chess and um, you know, a believer in uh, equal opportunity, I wish there were more women playing chess. So it's something I've talked about with guests in the past. But I'm curious as as an adult woman coming into the chess world um, from you know non chess background, did you feel that you were uh, welcomed? Um, definitely welcomed. Definitely. Um, was I comfortable? Um, sort of. (laughs) So I'm actually, um, I don't know if you're aware of this about me, but I, I'm a professional cornhole player. (laughs) That's an interesting thing about me. You've been mentioning it in your blog. I don't know what it is though. (laughs) Yeah. Cornhole is this, uh, it's, it's a kind of, um, basic game where there's boards placed 27 feet apart and you throw four bags at a hole in the center of the boards. You get one point if they're on the board, four, uh, three points if they're in. And it's, it's a big thing in the Midwest, um, like especially like um, Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, those kinds of places. But it's growing across the country. Um, but so the reason I'm bringing that up is because in that world, I am also one of the few women that is competing seriously. So it felt a little familiar, but a little disappointing, too, when I came to the chess world and there was very few women. I actually thought there would be more than there was, at least locally. Um, so I actually really do applaud any efforts to bring more women into the game. I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah. Like, I'm okay to like power through my uncomfortableness and stick with it, but I wonder how many women turn away because there, there's just not enough women to yeah. feel. <laughs> yeah, it becomes kind of a vicious cycle at some point. And uh, believe it or not, I do think it's gotten slightly better, especially at the scholastic level over the past 15 or 20 years. But we still clearly have a long way to go. But I'm glad that at least like, you know, from what you say, it doesn't sound like you were the recipient of like a lot of uh, overtly sexual sexist comments. Um, uh, or at least I hope not. <laughs> Yeah, not really. Everybody's been really welcoming and really wonderful. And uh, I would say that some people, you know, will underestimate me because I'm a woman sometimes. I think that's my sense. Um, But that's probably going to change because I've seen little girls with pigtails that can destroy everybody. So, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I think that's changing for sure. Um, So and and you're uh, you're not far behind those little girls. I mean, you're you're making incredible progress. So let's let's get into um, to how you've done it. What's you, you know, you're, you work full time, um, or at least <laughs> as well, as we'll discuss that, that may be changing in the near future, but, but you've been working a nine to five job. Um, so actually before we, before we get into your study routine, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what your work has entailed? Um, sure. So I've been working the last 20 years as a real estate developer for a nonprofit organization called Slavic Village Development. And so the main goal is to revitalize um, the neighborhood through housing and also to provide like quality, um, affordable and market rate housing in that community. And so I've been really um, into that the last 20 years. Um, I mean, it's a 40 hour a week job, but sometimes it's more. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you just do what you got to do. And right. um, but it's been a really good experience. Okay. Um, well, we we may come back to that. But so with a job that's forty hours a week and sometimes more, how do you how do you manage to cram in time for chess? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, definitely on the weekends, um, and of course after work is a good time to go to events. So like Harmer Chess Club is on Tuesday. So, you know, as long as I can um, get there, <laughs> I'm good. Like I, I'll be dead tired after work sometimes. But if once I'm there at the Parma Chess Club, I'm, I'm just um, elated to be there. And then um, we'll play until midnight or so. So is, is this like a weekly tournament or, or just yeah. a casual get together? Right. That's every Tuesday. It's a rated tournament. Okay. Quads, basically. So is it one game a week or you go and you play three fast games at night? Yeah, three rapid games. Okay. Wow, that's tiring. Yeah. Um, It's also fun, though. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Invigorating and and tiring at the same time. Um, Okay. And what about studying? Yeah, studying... um, Well, the way I handle that is I actually wake up early and I do probably about a one hour study every morning before I go to work. Um, That probably sounds tiring too, but actually um, I really look forward to that. It it helps me get out of bed in the morning. (laughs) Wow. That's awesome. That's, that's a good sign for your enthusiasm for, for chess. Um, Oh, I guess so. Um, Yeah. And like, I try to study things that I am interested in, you know? So like, if I know I need to work on my end game, I will work on it, but I also make sure to mix in stuff that I really enjoy as well. Okay. And uh, we'll get, we'll get, what is your, um, what, what aspects of chess do you enjoy most? I really love game analysis. Um, sometimes I joke that I like analyzing games more than playing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that's that's fun. That's not unusual in the chess world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm totally on board with that. Um, just learning new things about the positions because there's so much to learn. It's just really interesting and fascinating to me. Um, I love studying openings. Um, Endgame is also really fun to me. What I don't um, gravitate towards are like really volatile positions, like crazy positions where everything's hanging and mm-hmm. cool. I probably... Um, I'm not as attracted to those positions, but um, I really like positional play quite a bit. Okay. So all things being equal, you'd rather look at like a Capablanca game than, than a tall game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, it's good to identify your strengths, although sooner or later, unfortunately, you'll have to, to or fortunately or unfortunately, because it's kind of a good problem to have. You'll need to, to work on all aspects of your game. Um, right. Yeah. But I mean, we've also had many guests here just, share the advice that you know if you're if you're not a chess professional the then you're doing it for an enjoyment and you should really focus on what you enjoy um okay so we've got a question from a supporter of the podcast paul canalupo uh on the topic of study habits he asks uh given that we're all busy with so many aspects of our lives what study habit gives you the most return for your chess improvement you know um well i believe it to be um the most recent habit that I've acquired. Um, I want to share this because I was really excited when I figured this out. (laughs) Basically I did, um, I decided to do four sessions with, um, I am John Bartholomew. Um, I have a chess coach. He's probably about 1800, 1900 strength. And John Bartholomew is more like, you know, 2450 fide. So I decided that it would be a really good experience to work with somebody that strong and see if anything came out of that. And something did. Um, so what I noticed with going through my games um, with John was that he could point out like um, very common positional or tactical themes in my openings that my chess coach didn't necessarily catch right away or that I didn't know were common. Um, and a computer, you know, you analyze with a computer And it tells you the right moves sometimes, but you don't necessarily know why. You don't know if it's common. You don't know, you know, you don't know exactly what it's telling you. You can only guess. But by working with John, he would point out things. He'd say, oh, this is a really common idea. Did you know you have this threat here? Or did you know your opponent's going to do this here? Or, you know, and um, so what I did is I decided to make flashcards every time one of those positions came up. And, um... 
this led to me making flashcards of like any time I learned something, I basically take a screenshot of it. Not like physical flashcards. This is on the computer, but um, I'll do like a screenshot flashcard of it. I have like a text file answer key. And since I started doing the flashcards, like I feel like I've been on a roll, like in, in like 200 rating points in a few months. <laughs> wow. So, um, that's a strong endorsement. So I don't know if that's directly due to that, but it's, uh, definitely possible. And I really, what I really like about this method is that, um, it's basically an information retaining, uh, tactic. So now when I learn something, it gets burned into my brain as a pattern that I can recognize really quickly as opposed to learning something and then having to think a while to retrieve that information. So, um, I really like it for that. And I think it's very time effective as well because, you know, once you go through a set of, say, 50 flashcards, um, you know, and it might take you an hour. Once you go through it once, then it only takes 30 minutes. And then you go through it again, it only takes 15 minutes. And if you can go through 50 chess patterns in 15 minutes and get those inside your head, I feel like that's a really effective use of time for improving a chess. I agree. Okay, so we need to get a couple more details nailed down on how people can, can mimic this strategy. Um so how often are you uh, reviewing the flashcards? So I try to do it for um, just 15 minutes every day. And I keep track of how many I get wrong in a set. And then once I get a set um, 100%, 100% correct three times, then I set it side, aside for like a month. And then I go on to my other sets. Um, and it's it's fun. It's interesting. Um, every time, and I feel more confident when I learn something that I'll remember it because yeah. take that screenshot of it. I'll stick it in my flashcard, um, file folder. And I know that I'm going to be looking at that again. And yeah. I, I have to say, I've only been doing this like two months, but I've already seen like the exact positions on my flashcards, like at least a dozen times. Wow. This comes up often. <laughs> so that means your work is paying off. It also shows that you're playing a lot if you've seen it a dozen times already. Oh, uh, that's probably true, yes. <laughs> so so uh, how are they structured? So you mentioned that this was something from, from I Am John Bartholomew picking up on patterns in your game. So is it generally like opening ideas or is it like a tactical shot or all of like all of the above? What sort of, uh, of chess position and would be on your card and like how many moves would the answer typically be? Yeah. It's funny that you say that because it started out with just tactics. Um, so I would, you know, have like the critical lines. Sometimes there's three lines. Sometimes there's just one. Sometimes it's really simple, but if it's something I missed, I still want that on a flashcard. So I remember that I missed that idea. Um, but then as time went on, I'm like, well, this is more of a strategical threat. And so I started a strategical box. I call it a box, but really it's just file folder. <laughs> mm. And um, same with openings. I'm like, hey, I learned this new idea in this opening, this middle game plan I didn't know about, you know, and I will capture that on a flashcard as well. And I even add like um, digital like um, sticky, uh, sticky notes where I'll ask myself questions about the flashcards. So it won't necessarily be like, what's the tactic that wins the game? It might say, what are the three book moves or book moves in this position? Or it might say, what, um, what is black's best middle game plan in this position? Or how does white win this end game? Like, so basically anytime I learn anything, I, um, I make a flashcard of it. <laughs> wow. That's, um, yeah, I guess. And the fact that you take pictures, I think, is a good idea. You know, uh, Andres Criswa, um, friend of the podcast, who uh, people people's previous uh, adult improver, uh, he has a lot of study tricks that he shared, but one that he sometimes pops onto Twitter with is his own flashcards. But he and I've seen a few other of the, the Twitter chess punks, they like to do actual drawings of the chessboard. And it just cracks me up because they'll they'll share a puzzle and it'll be like it's white to move and win. And then you look and it's like a, you know, like a two year old's drawing of a horse and you're sitting there looking like, I don't I don't even know what this position is. How am I supposed to solve it? So anyway, long way of saying I like the fact that it's digitized. <laughs> right. Yes, me too. It makes it really easy to create them as well. You're not spending your time. I'm cutting stuff out of books or photocopying. You can just take a screenshot. You're done. <laughs> yeah, no. And I do want to say I get the idea that, that 
you know, uh, people would say that there are different learning methods and the very act of drawing the position helps sort of uh, tattoo it into your brain. So I get why they do that. But when I look at it online and I'm not the one that drew it, I'm just like, uh, I'm not going to spend five minutes trying to figure out like which piece is which <laughs> and stuff like that. But <laughs> anyway, getting back on track. So um, when you when you do the flashcards, if you get one wrong, you're just you're still done with that for that session, right? I yeah. Mean, so okay. I'm, Did that question make sense? Yeah. Like usually if I do a 15 minute session in the morning um, and I get two wrong, I mark it down in my notebook that I got two wrong on that set. So that means the next day I do it again and maybe I only get one wrong. And the next day I do it again and I get a hundred percent. Once I get a hundred percent three times in a row, that's when I set that one aside and move on to a next one. I just want to make sure those patterns are in my brain um, before I move on to the next set, basically. Nice. And do you feel like you have a good memory generally? Uh, it's funny. It's like my memory's so bad in a lot of ways, but for chess, it seems to be pretty decent. Like I can't remember people's names or faces, but I can remember a chess position. I don't know why that is. Uh oh, sounds like sounds like you've got talent to me. I, there, there are a lot of chess players like that for some reason. Yeah. So, um, so maybe maybe that's true that I have a. Uh, a slightly good memory for chess, but my memory in general makes me wonder, especially since I'll be turning 40 next year. So a little scared of what that will entail. <laughs> yeah. We, we were talking a bit about that before we recorded. So, um, the fact that you don't have kids, um, waking you up even before you want to study, I think at least you'll be okay for a while in my, as the opinion of a 41 year old. Yeah. Um, so, so you do your hour of study in the morning, do you? And you play on Tuesday nights. Do you get a chance to study when you get home, or do you play blitz, or uh, um, like what's the rest of your your week structured like in terms of chess? Yeah, um, I guess one thing that I do is um, well, if I'm sleepy after work and I just want to relax, I will often, very often, watch YouTube videos. Um, I really like GM uh, Ben Feingold. I like uh, John Bartholomew's videos, of course. I like um, Simon Williams, um, Yasser Sarawan. I'll um, watch whatever events are going on. And so I'm constant. So even if I'm just kind of chilling and I'm not necessarily up for any um, difficult calculation, I'm still like watching these videos, kind of getting seeing some ideas and some new patterns. So a blend of active and passive learning, I guess you could say. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the other thing I will do at home is set up my chessboard and play the computer without a timer. Um, and I feel like that's a really um, good practice method as well, where you can just feel like you have as much time as you want for position and try to find the right moves. And and like, you, oh, sorry to cut you off. Do, <laughs> do you play it at the highest level? No, I'll just play it like, um, like the next level above me. So okay. like 1500, I'd play like the 1650 setting or Good. whatever. Yeah. I, I find it, I find it depressing playing computers. Oh, I, yeah. I don't want to play like Stockfish nine. That, yeah. But even when I play ones, I theoretically should be stronger than I'm a little intimidated or psyched out. Uh, <laughs> I just don't play well against them. Um, and I don't think I'm the only one with this issue. I mean, I, you know, Kasparov has said that in the match uh, where he lost to Deep Blue, he felt like he was still stronger than it at that time, like even with the benefit of hindsight. But, you know, th also the writing was on the wall, but he was, you know, he didn't put his best foot forward in that particular match. And that's something even not being Kasparov that I can relate to when playing computers. Mm, makes sense. Okay, so, so Stacia, uh, something else we did with Andre... Um, Andres, when when we talked about adult improvement is I gave him a list of things you can do to get better at chess. And he gave basically his opinion on how useful each one is for um, for improving your chess. So oh. I think uh, I think I'd like to do that with you, too. So I've got a list of several things and then you could rate it on a scale of one to ten where you know, one is it doesn't help your chess improvement at all. And a 10 is like, it's amazing. Um, so number one is online blitz. What do you think? Online blitz. I'd have to give that like 
I guess it depends what your goal is. I mean, I would probably give it like a three because it helps me in my rapid games. But I think when I'm playing those slow classical time controls, it probably doesn't help me so much. Yeah. Yeah. The consensus Andre and I came to was maybe it, it helps if you use it as a learning tool for your openings. But oh, right. Um, but other than that, I, I don't think it's the best use of one's time, although it's fun. And, you know, having fun is, is good. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. <laughs> right. um, okay. Uh, next up, watching elite tournaments. Um, I would give that like a four. Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, one thing one thing about this is, uh, and I, I think I've I've discussed this before on the podcast, but uh, a lot depends on how focused you are. If you're really focused and trying to pretend like you're the one playing and uh, don't yeah. not checking, you know, your email and Twitter and everything else while you do it, it can be extremely useful. But personally, that's not how I consume content online. So for me, it's generally uh, not helping my chest much. Um, number three, studying openings. Openings, I would give a five. Okay, yeah, and checking out your blog, um, Stacia has a blog on chess.com called My Road to 1900 and Beyond, and I didn't get a chance to go through all of the posts, but uh, I checked it out some, and it seemed like you had a lot of discussion about openings generally. Do you do you find them of, uh, of particular interest? Yeah, I do. I really enjoy studying openings, which is probably why I spend more time than I think I should on them, but then also that really comes in handy in my games as well. So I do notice a lot of results due to openings and opening traps and that kind of stuff. But if I, if I were to be honest, I'd say that maybe I don't deserve to win those games. <laughs> no, it all counts. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but there's a difference between like figuring out how to strategically beat your opponent on your own and just um, pounding out lines you memorize. So like, um, so I think it, it helps me with my results, but I don't, I don't know that it helps uh, me become a better player as much as some other methods. Yeah. And another thing about openings is you mentioned that you play a lot of rapid games. And I think that for faster time controls in particular, knowing your openings gives you a huge leg up. So I can see how that would help with your results. And like if as for all the the people out there listening, it's something to take into account. Um in terms of uh, structuring your studying regimen, if you're if you're playing a lot of rapid games, you can't really fake it in the opening as much as you can in slow games, where you have time to to figure things out or dig yourself out of any sort of hole that that you might dig. And I'm speaking from experience here. <laughs> right. Okay, on to the next one: uh, exercise. Exercise. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I would give that, like, a six. But I'm no no expert on that. (laughs) Okay, yeah. Andre came from the perspective that he generally didn't like exercise, but then he decided it would probably be good for his chest. And that finally gave him the motivation to to start going for long bike rides. And he was a a strong proponent going forward of uh, of it being good for one's uh, chest results. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that just because I have, like, anxiety issues a bit, and exercise helps with my anxiety, and I also know it helps with stamina. So um, I do exercise almost every day quite a bit, so it probably does help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's a constant, it might be harder to evaluate, but but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in that camp that it, it's uh, one of the most important things you can do. Um, okay, and this one you mentioned earlier, studying end games. Yeah, end games. Um, you know, probably when you're going through the road that I went through, um, 1100 to 1700, it's probably just like a like a six, I'd say. Um, but I I do feel pressured to learn it better now. <laughs> yeah, I would say where you are now is about where it starts. In my opinion, it starts to escalate in importance. Um, but, yeah, it can be dry to study. I mean, some people really just feel a natural predis- predisposition for it, but I think more commonly people are more interested in other aspects of the game. But but it's important. All right, uh, next up, uh, Grandmaster Games, reviewing games in full. I know you already mentioned an enthusiasm for it. How, how helpful do you think it is? 
Um, it's definitely helpful. Um, I would say reviewing the books more than videos has helped me. So I would give it, you know, I would give that a six. Okay. Um, so rather than watching a YouTube video of a game analysis, actually sitting there and going through it yourself. Yeah. And really going in depth with it in your own time, I think. Yeah. So, so that gets back to the active versus passive learning, which I really think is the, the most important thing in all of, you know, Anything about chess improvement, I feel like, often comes back to the the more difficult the method of study is, the the higher reward there likely is. Uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> but that that's my personal opinion, and that's why I haven't been studying much chess lately. Um, okay, last but not least, and you just mentioned these, and this is something that I neglected to ask Andres Crisdois about, but uh, watching online videos. Yeah, watching online videos. Yeah, I mean, if you're not doing anything else and you're watching videos, then it's a 10, right? Because you're not doing anything else. Right. <laughs> um, but if you're doing that to get better at chess, I mean, it's probably like a like a four. I would say opening videos are probably like a six. Um, and end game videos are probably like a seven if you are slow with them, but then just chilling and watching videos is probably like a two or three really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so much of it comes into like, are you taking notes and are you like, what are you doing that will help you remember what you show? But you know, it's definitely never useless because you can always just see some new idea that, that seeps into your subconscious brain and then, you know, makes itself apparent when you need it most. So it's definitely better than nothing, but depends what you're putting into it. Um, okay. Uh, so how often do you play tournaments, Stacia? So you're um, playing every Tuesday? I play every Tuesday. Um, and then I go to Lakewood Chess Club every Thursday. And I usually play like one slow time control, just casual game. Um, against like a stronger player. I think it's important to play stronger players. So I do that there. Um, and then when the opportunity comes for the slower time control tournaments, I really like those. And I will travel for those some as well. Okay. I've really just been going in, in state like two to four hours for those. Um, but I'm, I want to do like um, three to four per year. And that that's kind of what I did in this last year. Okay. So you've already got four rated games a week and then some travel on top of that. Um, and you've got the Cleveland Open coming up, right? Right, that's this weekend. By, by the time this comes out, people will be able to uh, check the cross table online and see how you did. So so what section are you going to play in? Well, it looks like I'll be in the under 1900. Um, okay. And are you generally an advocate of playing up, playing in higher sections, um, or do you just play in uh, the, the you know, regular, whatever section you would be assigned? I usually do just play um, whatever section I'm assigned, but... Um, in the future, I may play up. This is already this already feels like up to me in this case, though. So <laughs> right, yeah, you've been moving up so quickly um, that yeah, this will be your first under nineteen hundred t- section, I imagine. Yeah, if I can just not get completely crushed, I'll be happy. <laughs> you, you need a more positive attitude, Stacia. You're going to be fine. <laughs> no one else is playing four games a week. I can tell you that much. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll be excited to see how how we do and how like uh, how I mean. Roughly how far is that from you? Are you someone who would get a hotel or would you stay at your house for like how how distraction free do you need to be during one of these weekend chess tournaments? Oh, this one is close. It's like 15 minutes down the road. Okay. So it's really great. I might even ride my bike there. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's dedication. I, I don't know. I don't know if I would advise that because those those things are exhausting. But uh, but we'll be we'll be excited to see how you do. Oh, um, thank you. Okay, and you mentioned uh, right before we recorded that you made a list of uh, 10 pieces of advice. Oh, that's correct. I did. Okay, let's have it. And then we'll do book recommendations, and then I want to talk about your transition, your career transition. So that's uh, sort of our, our laundry list. Um, but, but let's hear the recommendations. Okay, so here's the list I put together. Um, I'm calling it Study Tips I Have Embraced. Um, so number 10 is that when you're learning or choosing a new opening – it should be chosen by someone else. So what I mean by that is I can fiddle around with the computer and chess base and try and figure stuff out, but the openings that work best for me have come from someone who knows the lines already and recommends like a resource to learn it and play it um, a particular way. 
Um, so that's number 10. Number nine is don't forget about Endgame. Definitely have to do that. Um, yeah. I have someone's Endgame book, and I learned that through the um, 1600 uh, section. I do think that played a huge role in my progress. Number eight is over the board, and chess community is important. Okay. Um, I feel yeah. like playing so much and by engaging with the community, it helps to inspire me and keep me even more interested in chess and competitive too. Um, number seven is patterns make you better. I mentioned my flashcard method. So that is a method for retaining patterns in your head. So I think that's really important. Um, number six is about attitude. Don't focus on your rating. It's about learning. Like um, if you're in a game, for example, and you think, well, I know a safe move to play, but I also know a new idea I've been studying and it'll be risky if I play it, but maybe it'll be cool. Um, just play the new idea because what will happen is even if you lose the game, you'll learn like a new defensive resource to watch out for next time. And I think it's more important to learn than, than win if you're trying to improve. Um, That's excellent. I agree. Number five is teach or explain what you learn. Um, I have my YouTube channel. I like to go over games with my friends and go over why I made certain moves or what I learned from analysis. I think that helps solidify the ideas in my head. So I think that's played a role as well. Um, number four is tactics, of course. <laughs> um, but I would say don't go, don't just go on a tactics trainer, like on chess.com, for example. I would actually get a tactics book and learn it by theme. The reason I say this is I started with Tactics Trainer, but if there's patterns that you simply don't know yet because you didn't learn them, you won't necessarily learn it um, from one puzzle. But when you go through a theme, like a chapter of that of that theme, then when you go back to, to Tactics Trainer, you'll recognize it right away. So that's my advice That's there. excellent advice. And with the Tactics book, do you set up the positions or do you just do them in the book? Um, I, I set them up on my computer for the most part. Yeah. Okay. I put them up in skid probably better is over the board, but yeah. How much studying do you do over the board? Like with a physical chess set, just out of curiosity. Um, when I meet with my chess coach, we always do it over the board. Um, but most of my studying I do with my computer. Okay. I'll admit, um, I would prefer to do over the board, but you know, if you're, um, kind of wanting to chill a bit, it's easy to just take your laptop and, and, uh, and do it that way. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And that leads to number three. I think working with a coach is basically essential or just a stronger player in general. Um, that stronger player will show you the ideas that you haven't learned yet and then you can learn them. <laughs> yeah. And as you mentioned in your work with, uh, John Bar Bartholomew, they can also notice patterns in your play that you might not notice. I mean, you might, yeah. It's easy to get sort of lost in the woods of like, I lost this game because of this. I lost this game because of this. But there might be some overarching thread that you are unable to pinpoint. But someone who looks at a handful of your games right in a, right in a row will just see right away. Yes, exactly. And like the other thing that having a coach has done is um, it'll pressure you to work a little harder, which I think is important. Um, and, and also, they will sometimes... Um, have a method for you to study that you wouldn't think of on your own. So that's important too, like a certain book or a certain way of studying. Um, I think had I left myself to my own devices, I would have worked just as hard and only got half the results. Wow. Big so difference. I really think a coach is critical. Number two is game analysis. I'm obsessed with it. As I mentioned, always learn from your mistakes. I think that has made me a stronger player more than almost anything. And then number one is probably strange, but I put maintain balance between hard work and passion. Like, um, this is the same with cornhole for me, so I see a pattern there. But um, I just think, like, if you love chess and you really enjoy your time studying, that means a lot more than, like, grinding through something you really don't want to learn. Like, you should still do some grinding, of course, but I think um, – if you risk a burnout, that's going to hurt your performance and hurt your improvement. So I think it's better to always have a check on that balance. And if you're starting to feel burned out, have some fun, play some blitz, study an opening, <laughs> and then get back to the hard stuff after you feel better again. 
Okay, that is an awesome list. And Stacia, do you mind sending that to me? And then I can put it in a Google Doc and people can see it because I'm sure there's people that are like, uh, you know, frantically trying to write all this stuff down. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I, mean, I pr- yeah. probably should have said that before you shared the list. But uh, but yeah, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm sure people would really appreciate that. And I'm sure like uh, regular listeners um, will notice a lot of overlap of things that other guests have said, which is which is a good thing because it reinforces. It's it's not a mystery what to do. I mean, uh, everyone wants to know how do I get better at chess? How do I get better at chess? But you know, all the information is out there. It's really just a matter of like uh, setting up a structure that works for you and sticking with it, as you you do with waking up early and and competing so actively. Um. So book recommendations, Stacia, or you mentioned a few of your favorite YouTubers, um, just general improvement, like uh, study resources. What are your favorites? What have been, what have made the, you mentioned the Selman book, uh, Selman's Endgame course. Uh, what else has made a big impact for you? Yeah, that was great for like my introduction to Endgame. Um, but I have to say um, the book that's been helping me the most is Build Up Your Chest by um, GM Arthur Yusupov. Okay. That was, been a, that was recommended by my coach, and the structure of the book is wonderful. I love that every chapter it kind of switches gears. It keeps it interesting, and um, it's even though I'm in the very first book, it's actually really hard for me. <laughs> so I learn a lot when I go through it. So it just shows you what level you know he's probably at. Yeah, um, he's he's legendary trainer. <laughs> so he marks something as really easy, and I'm like, really, <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's good. I, you know, I know I'm a potser, basically. I know that I have a lot to learn. So that's good. I want to know what he considers to be basics. Um, the other book I thought really that really helped me was Chess Tactics from Scratch by um, Martin Wettishnik. Um That was the tactics book I used that went chapter by chapter through themes. And after going through that, my tech, my tactics trainer rating went from like 1200 to again, 1700. So, and I, I wouldn't get to 1700 without tactics, of course. So I really think that that book um, was really good for learning the different themes and the different different um, tactics on an introductory level. Okay, excellent. That is an original recommendation, which is getting harder to give every week. So that sounds great. And I, again, we'll put that on the books page if anyone can scroll to the bottom or if they just made made a note. Could you say the name and the author again? Yeah, that's Chess Tactics from Scratch by um, Martin Wetischnik. Okay, and in a similar vein, I think it might be a slightly more advanced level. I like this book called Chess Tactics by Paul Littlewood that also does uh, themes. Um, it's another one to check out after they finish with your recommendation. Um, okay, so Stacia, I think we've basically covered all of the major points I wanted to hit about uh, chess improvement. I mean, I think you've given people a lot of actionable advice and good recommendations, but you've also been very active in the past week with this, uh, this um, slow reveal about a, a career change um, from, from your career that you mentioned in uh, real estate development for a nonprofit to uh, a career in chess. So um, as I know you haven't divulged all of the details yet on your blog, but could, would you be willing to share as much as um, you want to our listeners? Um, yeah, sure thing. Um, so I've been kind of like kicking around this idea for the past year, maybe year and a half. And um, it turns out we do have a really active um, chess organization in Cleveland. And I mentioned them before, the Progressive Chess Organization and their nonprofit, which the um, the place I work for now is nonprofit. So it has uh, so nonprofit management is relevant there. And um, they actually go into schools and they hold like chess clubs and teach kids and do programming, that kind of stuff, as well as hold tournaments, promote chess. And um, so essentially what happened is by volunteering a little bit with them, um, teaching a class every Friday, um, I got involved with them and I started seeking maybe working for them part time. And when I was kicking around all my ideas for different income streams, um, because I actually have a lot of ideas, um, one key thing would be like a part-time job with Progressive Chess. So I actually made the decision, this is where it gets crazy, because I made the decision to leave my job and sort of jump on this path. And number one on my list was I'm going to volunteer like actual work hours per week with Progressive Chess 
in hopes that they will hire me. And I, I do write grants as part of my job. So my idea was, okay, well, I can write grants for them. And after I raise money, I'll say, can you hire me with that money? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, like write a grant that includes hiring me or something. So that was really my plan. And it seemed a little risky, but I thought I would just go ahead and try it. Um, well, it turns out um, when I decided I was going to quit my job, I was like, well, instead of working just Fridays, um, I'd like to teach every, or yeah, instead of teaching just Fridays, I'd like to teach every day of the week. So I went ahead and called them and asked if I could teach Monday through Friday. And they said, yeah, you know, that that probably works. Uh, let me double check and get back to you. And I said, okay. And then I got a text that was like, hey, will you meet with us? <laughs> and when I went in uh, to meet, they basically offered me a job right then. Um, so it was it was really crazy how that worked out. I had already decided to leave my job. Um, and what they're offering me is a part-time job, but with the intention that it will become full-time at some point. And that's good enough for me. Um, the other thing about it is I am taking a bit of a pay cut. It's not extreme necessarily, but it's significant. Um, but I'm not someone that has ever, I'm not like a, um, fancy person. I don't necessarily need fancy things. I like things simple. All I need is a chessboard. I like huh. <laughs> Excellent. A computer, you know, a room. I don't, I don't need a lot to be happy. So, um, money has never been a huge concern for me, but what it, what does matter for, for me is spending my time and being involved in things that I care about. And, um, and for it to have meaning. And this particular group um, targets like kids in need and kids in like um, inner city Cleveland that maybe are living in poverty or maybe getting into trouble. And they're using chess as a way to help these kids and to engage them. So so it's like it's about chess, but it also has meaning behind it. So I, there's no way I could pass it up. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't know if um, I did an interview with the head of um, Bay Area Chess, Judith Stray, and she she talked about the the challenges of raising funds. So if you're able to to bring money into the organization, that would be even better. I mean, it's obviously uh, sounds like an incredibly noble mission, um, and I know there are there are successful organizations out there, um, but you know they could always use more resources, as with many education endeavors. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to try my best and hopefully I can do something, you know? So we'll yeah, see. and it's great. It's funny. I mean, it's kind of ironic because, uh, you know, I'm, I run after school chess programs and um, mm. I've taught a lot of organizations. And even though generally the teacher population in schools is predominantly women, of course, in chess programs, it's the opposite. And I always feel like that contributes to the, um, to the general problem of, um, you know, way too many men playing, not too many men playing, but uh, the ratio of men to women being out of balance. I always feel like when when I have uh, worked with effective woman teachers, I mean, they're so inspiring for for the kids. So it, I think that that in particular will, will be uh, a great benefit. Huh, that's great. I hadn't really considered that, but that will be nice. If that's true. <laughs> yeah. And what ages will you be teaching? Um, so it varies. Um I'll teach like first through third graders, but then also switch gears sometimes and teach middle school age. So both of those. Yeah. And it seems like you'd be a natural at it. So so it should be exciting. And for any listeners who might be interested in, um, in having you coach them and reveal all your secrets and your share your flashcards and all that stuff. Do you, do you do, or are you interested in doing any one-on-one coaching? That is something I'm interested in ramping up. Um, so yeah, I, I could probably only take on like two people um, more than I have, but um, that would be something I would consider. Wow, but only two, even with the uh, scale back in hours? <laughs> yeah, for now. I'm stuck working part-time there till the end of the year. They said they would pay my health insurance, so <laughs> okay, <laughs> got to ride that out. But... Part-time at your, your former job. <laughs> yes, exactly. But after okay. January, um, then it really, really should open up in a, in a more meaningful way. Excellent. And you kind of made allusions in your blog post about this career change to have sort of a, a, a multi-pronged plan. So do you have like uh, bigger ambitions down the road or like uh, what, what's your vision of, of what your life will be like in a few years or are you just sort of taking it one step at a time? Um, well, it's a little of both. So I do have 
Um, as I mentioned, I'm also a professional cornhole player. And what's funny about that is that world is exploding. And I actually tried to retri- retire from cornhole, but with the way things are exploding and it's all over ESPN, um, there's all kinds of money and sponsors um, entering into that world. So um, I want to remain a professional cornhole player because it's like the worst time to leave ever. And also I feel like um, through my job, I have worked in marketing and promotion and that kind of stuff. And I want to take the skills that I've learned and apply it to the cornhole world. I want to raise money and sponsors in that world as well um, and raise money and sponsors in the chess world. And I feel like, um, some of that will be sort of for progressive chess and some will be on my own. Um, so I am hopeful to actually um, have time to work on, on those sorts of ideas as well. Okay. So we got to dig in more to your being a professional cornhole player. So, <laughs> so uh, how did it, uh, how did it come about? Like um, when did you become a professional? Um, what does that entail? Like uh, got to, got to, find out more details yeah i mean it definitely happened by accident um it was kind of the this like i'm kind of wired to be like obsessed with one thing and then just do it until i get pretty good at it (laughs) um and also also the mark of a good chess player (laughs) is it yes definitely Um, yeah so like with cornhole that's what it was like my my dad introduced it to me like in our front yard um and he is just crushing me game after game and Finally, um, I was like, that's it. You know, he's going down. So I went out, bought my own boards, bought my own bags, and started practicing just to beat my dad. That's really all it was. Um, But in that process, I really fell in love with it, figured out that there was all sorts of leagues, and there's a greater world for cornhole, too, even a national level. Um, So I ended up getting involved in all of that and just improved over time to the point where I actually became a professional. Totally by accident, though. (laughs) Um, And it sounds silly, and maybe it is a little bit, but I think over time it's getting to be a more serious thing. And um, just to give an example of how that world is exploding, like the national tournaments in the past have averaged like twenty to 40000 in prize money, and this year is 250000 Wow. A significant jump. Um, There's a lot of people making it onto ESPN and sponsors love that. So there's opportunity for sponsorship money. And so I feel like um, that's something I want to be a part of as well. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So if you played this tournament, would you be like, do they have seeds? How do you, would you be, would you have a good chance of winning a a prize? I would in the women's section uh, for sure. I have a good chance there. Um, I was the, two-time women's champion in the past um so you know maybe i'll be able to to win it again but i'll need to practice and get back on top of my game but you're planning on doing that as well i am you know it's kind of funny because when i retired from cornhole for about six months my plan is to go full-time chess and pour everything into it but that goes back to what i was talking about with burnout and making sure you have passion for the game Because with cornhole, um, you can't play it indoors. So in the winter, it's like you have to go out and play it. Otherwise, you can't play. So you're dying to play quite a bit. With chess, you have the online phenomenon. (laughs) You know, and it's all there's always a board sitting around. It's like um, it's like every well, with most of my free time, I was engaging with chess so much that I was starting to burn out on it a little bit. So I actually think it's good for my chess to have this other hobby as well. Um, where I'm switching between the two because it keeps both of them uh, exciting for me. Yeah. Weird perspective, but I think burnout is real and I want to avoid it. <laughs> yeah. One, one bit of advice I was going to give you about transitioning into teaching is I know, I know a lot of, it seems like if you're a chess teacher that, that that would help your chess, but a lot of chess teachers, myself included, would, would beg to differ because mm-hmm. if you spend time teaching students at a lower level, um, it, can sap your energy and make it harder for you to to think at the level you're used to about chess when you study and it can also in your downtime it, you know you might be less encouraged to to spend it on chess so that's just something uh, my general advice would be to sort of uh, protect your time basically um, so that so that you're not working too many hours teaching if you can find a way to make that happen um, because uh, otherwise as you mentioned uh, burnout definitely is something that 
you know, as with chess and any other profession can happen. I appreciate that advice. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Um, well, I think, Stacia, we've covered uh, all of the, the main topics I, I wanted. I'm, I'm excited to see how, how your chess progresses and also the, the cornhole. I know, as I mentioned, I know, you, I know you're pretty active on Twitter. If you're ever in like a competition on cornhole, would you, was that something you would mention or do you, do you keep that life separate? Um, I'll mention it occasionally, uh, but I like to keep my Twitter very chess-based. And then my Facebook page is very cornhole based. So okay, I separated that way. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, because I, I I was just looking at a picture online. I mean, I I've seen the game, but I never even knew what it was called. Um, but now <laughs> now of course, I mean, I'm I have no, I don't think I'll be entering any tournaments or anything. But I, I'm interested. I'm always interested in subcultures. So it's, it's funny that you're kind of knee deep in two of them now. Right. Yeah. It's definitely its own subculture. I, I'm like you. I, I enjoy subcultures. So. Um, yeah, so this is a natural fit for me, both of them. <laughs> how, how would you compare the sort of uh, the disposition of chess players to cornhole players? Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I would say that chess players are generally um, more intelligent, uh, I would definitely say, but also socially, more socially awkward, <laughs> yeah. stuff included. I'm not counting me out. Um, but cornhole players are often... Um, well, a few of them are chess players as well, which I wasn't expecting there to be so many. But there's there's a good chunk of cornhole players who are also chess players. And, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. The two worlds actually do intersect in some small way. Um, and then it's people who love tournaments and competition. And I think that's where I really fit, too, because I love tournaments. I love competition. I love community. And that's something that both worlds have. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, cool. Well, is, well, Stacia, is there anything else that, that you would like to mention or any topic that you um, feel should be highlighted? I think that was it. Just thank you so much for having me. Um, I really enjoyed this experience and um, I, I can't wait to go back and listen to all your podcasts. <laughs> cool. Yeah, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll keep you busy. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot there. But yeah, and we'll be excited to see how you do. And, you know, hopefully... Um, have you back on in a couple of years? I don't know what, what your timeline is like. Actually, before I let you go, I should ask because I know um, Andres was very explicit about his goals. Do you have a, like a specific uh, rating goals in mind um, as you plot out your chess development? Um, I mean, sort of is the answer. So, um, I mean, my dream is to become international master. I, I would really love that. I also understand how difficult that is and that the chances are going to be really tough at my age. Um, but I think there's a chance. So I want to um, study as if, as if that can happen um, or as if that will happen. So that's basically what I do. Um, and then I like to go by increment. So my blog says road to 1900. Well, that said 1700 just a few months ago. Um, I want to get to 1900 and go from there, but I would love to at least be a master. And then I would push for I am if things go well. That's awesome that you set lofty goals. It's, it's funny. It strikes me as funny that your goals are sort of the, the odd number hundreds, like 1700 and 1900. Most American players gravitate towards the even ones because in the, in the continental chess tournaments, they have more commonly like under 1600 and under 1800 sections and under 2000. So the mere fact that you're aiming for like different increments, I think uh, shows your, the, the lack of materialism that you, that you alluded to earlier. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so is that something that just started like from organically from like an original goal of 1500 or how did, how did you settle on the odd numbers? I mean, not that they're odd. People know what I mean. Um, yeah, I, I kind of make them up as I go, whatever feels right. So when I when I was 1,200, 1,400 was my goal. And I, I reached that very quickly. I just had a string of, of good games. And I went from 1,200 to 1,400. But then I must have been overrated because it took me over a year to break 1,500, um, which was my goal for, for that entire time. But once I broke that, um, then 1,600 was a goal. That also took a little bit longer but 1700 wasn't even necessarily a goal right away. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just sort of organic. I I like to say that my real goal is to be a better player, um, today than I was yesterday. Excellent. I I think, (laughs) I think that's a good note to end on Stacia. So 
Um, for people who want to follow your journey, I will uh, link to your, your Twitter account. You mentioned a YouTube page, and I guess people can, can reach you through there. Is there any other, um, any other medium I should uh, link to for people? I mean, I could share that my... my oh, your chess.com blog. Yeah, my chess.com blog is under the username Midna's Lament. Um, that is a Zelda reference. Okay. <laughs> is that Zelda the video game? Yeah, exactly. Twilight Princess. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, yeah, I'll uh, I'll link to those. And, and like I said, if you could um, send me your, your list of uh, 10, 10 pieces of advice, I'm sure people will appreciate that. And I'll link to the books. And hopefully all you listeners out there have a lot more, uh, have a longer to-do list than you did uh, when we began this interview. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thanks a lot and good luck. Uh, we'll be rooting for you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. If you like the show, shout it from the hilltops. Tell your friends. Write positive reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform. If you don't like the show, just keep it to yourself. I want to give special thanks to Geert Vandervelt for making the intro music. And of course, I have to thank my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners, without whom the show would not be possible. They are Adam Ralph, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Andres Krizdwa, Alex Pejas, Brian Mullis, Carl Labans, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Christopher Wood, Coach J's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, I am Christoph Zalicki, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jacob Agard, James Bonastia, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Hartman, John Jernigan, Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, WGM Katarina Nemkova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopalakrishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passy, the producer of Perpetual Chess, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randall Temple, Ricky Grahava, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Victor Vrankulj, FM Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks again, everyone. I will be back soon with another interview. Bye.